this Welcome to the fade route. This will be the best show tonight. With DNZ. Here are your hosts. DNZ. Welcome everybody to this week's episode of the Fade Route with DNZ. I am Z and we got a great show for you. We are previewing the NBA Finals. The Rangers take out the Hurricanes, and now host the Tampa Bay Lightning in the Eastern Conference Finals and the NHL, and we are ordering up our favorite all-time NHL hockey jerseys, hockey sweaters, to be more specific. But we start with the weekend that was in football, and what a weekend it was, especially if you were a fan of the UEFA Champions League. The game, the match for the entire marbles, the whole enchilada, the whole ball of wax with Real Madrid and Liverpool was delayed more than 30 minutes, citing security reasons. Now, being in the age of Twitter and social media, we're able to see these security reasons in real time. Somehow, the gates of Stadia Paris were locked, but only for Liverpool fans. Real Madrid fans had no problem getting in. And when these fans were trying to get in, security were were macing them. And police came and fired tear gas. That stuff's supposed to happen inside the stadium, not outside the stadium. That's supposed to happen, that's supposed to happen within the walls, not outside the gates. And UK sports minister Nigel Huddleston tweeted, we're very concerned about the upsetting scenes around the Stade de France last last night, meaning Saturday night, and shall be working with the appropriate authorities to find out what happened and why. And this significantly impacted the atmosphere of the match. You could tell that the Liverpool supporters were very muted compared to the Real Madrid supporters and ultimately Real Madrid took it 1-0 and this is just a black eye on this event. As we, If we recall correctly, this event, this UEFA Champions League final was supposed to be in Russia. So this was moved from Russia to Paris because of the instability and the political nature of Russia at this moment, the political climate was not something that should uh, should be rewarded with a something an event as lucrative as the UEFA Champions League final. But for this to happen, it makes you wonder and calls into question like, what is going on and like, whether or not it was just better off going on as is if this was the result in the new place, in the new stadium. And here he is. I've known this guy since so days on carousel shoes. Flight crew through and through the last QB in St. John's history. What's up, D? How's it going, man? Hey, yeah, it was definitely out of control. I mean, you got kids in the, you got kids out there. You tear gassing kids. And, you know, reports are it was just two officers that, you know, didn't follow protocol as far as shooting off the tear gas. That's bullshit. There was more than just two guys. And then they're trying to say, oh, it was the Americans that there was, that was the problem and that there was 40,000 fraudulent tickets. Like, come on, guys. Like, it, it was unnecessary. It was dangerous. And from what I understand, reports are that people who were affected can file complaints, can take legal action because the use of tear gas was unacceptable. It absolutely was unacceptable. And, you know, it just calls into question why the gates were closed. That's what I want to know. Like, that that's my main question. I understand. Okay, fraudulent tickets. Like, here, we go to an event. This is got a story. I got tickets 
for Ranger Stars for my mother's birthday back in 2015. I got them off a secondary market. We go, we have a nice dinner. We go to the, we go to Madison Square Garden, go to scan them. Bogus. Already been scanned. We got scanned. So what do you do? Like, does the Madison Square Garden security team escalate the issue? We're already embarrassed. We're already angry. I remember my sister wanting to page the guy and beat the shit out of him. So, like, how do you de-escalate the situation to the point where you are not firing tear gas, you're not pepper spraying the people who are trying to get into your event who have legitimate tickets, and how are you, as a security force, making sure that you are make you're getting this event off without a hitch? And there just seems to be a colossal blunder, and I don't know how UEFA rectifies this. To be honest with you, I mean there are going to be lawsuits, and rightfully so. Um, they are going to lose a lot. They are going to you know damages are going to be awarded. And, you know, the pocketbook, I don't know if this is going to change their, their practices and protocols, but something definitely needs to change because you can't have, you can't have an insecure event like this, especially now you're going to go, the next big event is going to be the FIFA World Cup in Qatar. Like, what's going to happen in Qatar? Like, is this setting the stage for something potentially even worse? Because now you know, you're going to talk about an even bigger stage. Do you love brownies? Of course you love brownies. But you know what's better than a brownie? A delicious, handcrafted, gourmet brownie delivered right to your doorstep. That's what our guys at Sweet Life Brownie Co. offer. Chef Tommy D and the crew offer a dozen delicious delights that you will crave. From the classic OB to Dutch Apple to Campfire S'mores and many more. Check out their website, sweetlifebrownieco.com, for their Friday brownie drops. At noon, their site goes live, and you see what they're making. Since you're there, become a site member and earn points. You earn 50 points just by signing up. Make sure you follow them on Instagram and Facebook, too, at sweetlifebrownie underscore co for the latest updates and their latest releases and creations. That's sweetlifebrownieco.com. Give them a call, 845-641-3043, and tell them D&Z sent you. That's sweetlifebrowniecode.com, 845-641-3043. Sweet Life Brownie Co., because there's always room for a brownie. And so much to talk about today. Uh, Aside from that, we had a pair of Game 7s. Over the weekend, the Rangers blew out the Hurricanes 6-2, and the Celtics beat the Heat 100-96. Very rarely does the visiting team win a Game 7, and it happened twice over the weekend. Which win was more impressive to you, Z? Well, I'm going to have to go with the Rangers beating the Hurricanes on the road. The Rangers took it to a team that was undefeated at home in the playoffs. There's a marked home field advantage in Carolina beyond the shady shit they were trying to do, trying to bar Ranger fans from buying tickets. Like, even beyond that, they were 7-0 at home. The, the Hurricanes play a clamped pressure defense. They play hard. They play smart. And the Rangers played harder. And the Rangers played smarter. They got deep. They were able to get out in space, and they were able to clamp down on the guys like Svechnikov, and they were able to neutralize players like Sebastian Ajo, like Tony D'Angelo scored a goal, Uh, Vincent Trocek held in check, so it was a good defensive effort. Igor Shosturkin shown huge, two goals on 37, uh, 39 shots, so 37 saves, a 9-4-9 save percentage. And overall, they just played a crisp game from top to bottom and got contributions from multiple lines. That's the thing that we're going to have to see moving forward when they play the Tampa Bay Lightning. So 
we're definitely going to kind of preview that momentarily, but I'm going to have to go with, with the Rangers here. Cause we, if we look at the heat and the Celtics, it was from jump at the end of the first quarter, it was 32, 17 Boston. Like the heat, you know, just did not have it. Miles Struess didn't have it. Kyle Lowry didn't have it. Tyler Hero only played seven minutes in the game. I, that, I think that's a definite, you know, we, we like to, you know, minimize his role a little bit. I mean, he is the sixth man of the year. So that definitely, you know, he gives you some spark, a little bit of energy. But when he doesn't play, like, that's going to be a problem. And if you look at that, like, Oladipo played 33 minutes. That's a very short rotation. It, it was an eight-man rotation. Like, that's, that is definitely telling. And, you know, Jimmy Butler played all 48 minutes. Like you can't you you can't have that short of a of a, a rotation and expect to win in the longs in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, it was the Rangers. I mean, going into the, after that game seven, the the Hurricanes outscored their opponents twenty five to fourteen at home. And before Game 7, they outscored their opponents 23-8. to I mean, they were just dominant at home. But it just, you know, it just became time. They weren't going to go through the whole playoffs without losing a home game. You know, Carolina, like you said, was undefeated up until that point. And, you know, they made it extremely hard for people out of state to get tickets there, which is such bullshit. The fact that the NHL let that happen is just trash. But you know what? Karma's a bitch. They're gone. <laughs> Whatever. If anybody from Carolina wants to come see some Ranger hockey, to see them take on the Lightning, MSG doesn't discriminate. World's most famous arena. Anybody can come. Um, as far as the Celtics, the Celtics win was impressive, but the Heat were hurt. Jimmy Butler was exhausted. The Celtic and the Celtics were rolling. You know, um, sure the Rangers were the better team up until Game Seven, but you know nobody nobody had. You know, nobody had beaten Carolina at home. And the goal differential was outstanding. So, yeah, I'm going with the Rangers as well. No, absolutely. And, you know, it was a very evenly matched series. It was a defensive struggle. It's something that we definitely, you know, we relished because that's what playoff hockey is. It's not... It's not really what we're seeing from Edmonton and Colorado, which was, you know, eight six. Like that's a baseball score. Like that's not that's <laughs> not hockey. Like I'm sorry, hockey is grit. It's hitting. It's dumping. It's chasing. It's played in short. It's played in small spaces, and it's played physically. And I don't. Know, I don't know. Like. The Stanley Cup is going to be very interesting because you'll have a very skilled team coming out of the West. And out of the East, you're going to have a very balanced team that is going to give you that grit, that's going to give you that snarl, that physicality. So we're definitely going to see... We're going to see some interesting... Like, an interesting battle of wills and battle of philosophies. But... Speaking of philosophies, in the closing seconds of the Heat Celtics game, Jimmy Butler had a chance to tie the game with about 18 seconds to go. But instead, he elected to go for the lead and took an uncontested three on a fast break. Do you have any issues with Butler taking that shot? Uh, <laughs> I, you know, the last three teams to eliminate Jimmy Butler from the playoffs have won the NBA title. I mean, if you you look at it from his eyes, he's this close to getting back there. You know, I don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem taking a three that shot. He's the, he's the best player on their team. He was having an incredible two game stretch, and he was wide open. You know, Crawford was stepping back. He wasn't stepping up. He was giving him the shot. I mean, like think about it this way: Would you be okay with LeBron taking that shot? Would you be okay with Paul Pierce taking that shot? Would you be okay with Steph Curry, Luka Doncic? Of course you would. So Jimmy t- Jimmy Butler has to take that shot. And honestly, I think Jimmy was exhausted. I think he knew that they could not go into overtime and win the game. And he they had the best chance of winning in regulation with him taking that three. What do you think? I think that you're definitely, like, if you're wide open, 
you got to go for it. Because if it's if it's completely uncontested, I mean, you have the best shot. You have the best chance to do it. Now, like you said, Jimmy Butler was exhausted. He played the full game. He played every minute of the game. So, at that point, what is left of his legs? I don't know. Now, since he's uncontested, you're also killing time if you are slowing down and then running a set. Like, okay, that's fine, but you're now going to push it into overtime with a very short bench. I mean, you effectively had two people, right? Because Hero only played seven minutes. I don't, he's not getting back out there for overtime. And I think Jimmy knows that. I think Jimmy Butler realizes that. Like, Hero's not giving us anything tonight. Oladipo played 33 minutes. Like, we have a very, we have a very, very short rotation right now. So I'm going to have to do this right now. And I don't have a problem with it. It's very similar to the Kawhi Leonard shot that knocked out the Sixers. Like, it's the time, it's the place, it's the situation. It's the right guy. If it was, you know, some dude off the bench, like if it was Udonis Haslam, right? Udonis Haslam. <laughs> If it was Udonis, what are you doing? Right. If it if it was old man Udonis Haslam, I would have a problem taking that shot with him taking that shot. If it was like uh, name any arbitrary Miami Heat player, but this is your guy, this is your stud, and I, I have no problem. What with about that Victor Oladipo? Victor Oladipo takes that shot. You okay with it? Victor Oladipo prior to the knee injury. Yeah, but I, I don't. I, I, Victor Oladipo, 2015. Yeah, Victor Ol. <laughs> right. Honestly, but to to answer your question, LeBron James taking that shot. I. It, it depends. It frankly depends. LeBron James ten years ago. Yes. Broken down LeBron James now with the knot in his groin. Probably not. You know, I like, I would rather. Some guys, I'd rather you set up and rather drive the net and try and work well, that's an what, end that's, what I, that's what all the analysts are saying. It's like, oh, yeah, you drive to the basket. You possibly get an N1. It's like, yo, you're going up against Al Horford. That's not an automatic, man. <laughs> well, well, not like, even that. Like, not even that. Just lay it in. Like, let him go. Like, but why, why would you try and stop him at that point? You're going to get true. the ball back. You're going to get the it, ball back. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So at that point, it's like when Ahmad Bradshaw fell on his ass in the, when he scored a touchdown again in the Super Bowl against the Patriots. The Patriots weren't trying to stop him. Listen, they were trailing the whole game. They never had a lead. You know, so Boston was in control of that game. Miami was shot. You know, it was it was going to happen. You know, it's, the, the writing was on the wall. And you know what? Even if he hits that three... There's still enough time for Boston to come down, run a set play, and go ahead. So it's, Absolutely. Nothing's in stone. You can't help but smile when you see a balloon. The simplest occasion is a party. Westchester Popstar is located in New Rochelle, New York, offers balloon styling and decor for all life's events. Birthdays, anniversaries, weddings, showers, school and corporate events, store openings, or just because. Westchester Pop Stars takes balloons and shapes them into works of art, creating decorative installations for your special occasions. No event is too big or too small, and their custom personalization service is top notch. Westchester Pop Stars is a private studio, quickly expanding. In person consultation is by appointment only. Send an email to westchesterpopstars at gmail.com for more information or to schedule an appointment. No need to hire an event stylist. All you need is balloons. Currently servicing Westchester, Putnam, New York City, and Connecticut. To find Westchester pop stars, search for them on Instagram, Facebook, or Google. But, you know, the NBA Finals are now set. The Golden State Warriors will be taking on the Boston Celtics on Thursday. We always talk about offense winning games and defense winning championships. Do you think that seal that saying will prevail in this series? Mm, defense will slow down 
the offense. It won't necessarily eliminate the offense. For me, the key to this is going to be rebounding, right? If if by the, the basketball gods, right, the Golden State Warriors have an off night, and this is, you know, it's happened. We, we've seen it. It's not like the it's the albino tiger in the wild, but we have seen it. It has happened. If they have an all off night shooting, who is down low? Who are your bigs? Like who is going to rebound? Draymond Green, okay. Kayvon Looney, okay. I prefer Rob. I, I'd rather prefer Williams and Horford. I want the guys who are bigger who are going to bang the boards, crash the boards, and, you know, impose their will. Because if you look at the playoff leaders, right, Kayvon Looney is the leader at 7.7 rebounds per game as an average. Al Horford is averaging almost 10. (laughs) So he's going to have his way. Like, Al Horford is a wily veteran. There's a reason why the Celtics went and got him back. Right, He is a wily veteran. And he can be that guy for Tatum and Brown to play off of. And this is a very evenly contested series. You know, this is going to be super entertaining. And ultimately, this is, you know, it's defense will slow down the offense. But I still think the Warriors are going to have enough and are diversified enough because they don't have just the Splash Brothers, right? You're looking at Wiggins. Wiggins provides like, an additional scoring, uh, an additional scoring uh, avenue. So it's not just going to be just chucking up threes. Now, granted, a majority of their the majority of their offense is going to come from chucking up threes, but I think they're going to have a lot more in the tank, and I think they're going to be deeper. And that depth is going to matter in the end. So I'm narrowly taking Golden State over Boston. It's going to be close. Twist my arm, Golden State in seven. Yeah, I mean, they split the season series. You know, Boston's, you know, definitely going to battle. They've been, de- Boston's definitely been battle tested. You know, beating the Nets, the Bucks, the Heat. The Warriors, you know, they they haven't really played that much talent in this playoffs, um, and they're good and they they know what it takes to win an NBA championship. But yeah, I'm 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 really going with the the Celtics on this. Um, they really come they've really come together as a team the last two months. You know, we had kind of spiked them dead at the All Star break, and they're trying to prove us wrong right now. But they're deep. And they they're defensive. I think they'll be ready for the Warriors. Um, the only the only you know tip my hat to the Warriors because they've been there before. They can shoot the lights out, but you know Boston plays defense and uh, they play as a team. And I think they're fine ways to win. And, and I think this this the, the old cliche, the old saying, yeah, defense wins championships. I think defense gets you there. Defense gets you in the moment. But, I mean, if you're talking about one game or one series in basketball, I mean, these these guys can shoot the lights out. But I do like Boston's chances. So who, what individual player is the X factor for you? It's Marcus Smart, man. It's Marcus Smart because uh, he was he was the last series for me too. I mean, he's their best defender. He's arguably going to have the toughest job of this defending Steph Curry. Um, I think they're going to try to lock Steph down with with Marcus Smart, but even if they switch, he'll be on pool, he'll be on clay. To me, Marcus Smart is the X factor for the whole series and for the Boston Celtics. Now to flip it on the offensive side, I mean on the on the Warrior side, I think the player to watch is Clay. Clay is the guy. If Clay could lead the second unit, if he's dropping 30 points and you know just taking like you know 15 threes, that's a problem. You know, so and that's the way that's the only way I could see the Warriors beating the Celtics. If you spread them out, you start hitting threes from half court or, you know, 10 feet behind the line like they like to do. You spread out that defense. It's going to allow Draymond Green to operate. It's going to allow Wiggins to operate. 
it's going to allow other members of their second unit to operate. But if you're going to try to run your basic offense within the three-point line, Boston's going to be all over that. Mm. I hear you on that. Who's who's your X Factor? So for me, the X Factor for the Celtics is actually Al Al Horford because he's got a he's got the tough job of neutralizing Draymond Green down low. So I mean, Kayvon Looney, like Draymond Green, they'll they're going to make it tough. But I think Al Horford's going to have to control the boards and make sure that they're going to be able to transition from defense to offense. Or on the offensive side of the board, you know, on the offensive boards aspect, he's going to need to go in and he could definitely clean up on that. So that's going to be an interesting matchup that I'm going to look at. That's Draymond against Al Horford. Now for the Warriors, you know, I feel like they're going to key in on Curry and Thompson just because they're Curry and Thompson. Like, this is what they do. Like, this is, you know, we've seen this a million times. So that's where Andrew Wiggins is going to earn his contract, whether it's with the Warriors or otherwise. You know, he needs to be, he needs to step up and be the third guy. You know, Jordan Poole has been great, right? He's been averaging 18.4 points per game. But Andrew Wiggins, he's going to kind of diversify what you're doing because he's not a guard. Like, we're talking about a very guard heavy offensive attack you start putting Wiggins out there and Wiggins starts doing things you know it could that could swing this very quickly but you know it's definitely going to be an interesting season uh, interesting series I should say and we're I mean you have the underlying storyline right of the Warriors winning without Kevin Durant showing that you know like they didn't need him to begin with right and And how also, how bad is it that how bad do the Nets look hiring Steve Nash over Ime Odoka, the guy who was on the bench in Brooklyn, and now not he's in that, the NBA Finals? Yeah, not only that, but both teams in the finals, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Irving left the Celtics; they go to the finals. Kevin Durant left the Warriors; they're in the finals. How crazy is that? Like both teams that those guys left are there, and how foolish does Kevin Durant look leaving this team? You know, you could, I mean, Kyrie is whatever. I mean, he's going to do whatever. You would just thought that Kevin Durant was a little bit more sensible. You left Curry, Draymond, and Clay to go play with Kyrie Irving in Brooklyn. Really, dude? Really? I mean, if they had Kevin Durant in this series, it'd probably be a wrap. Totally. The problem is, is that, you know, ego gets in the way, right? Like I said last week, that's still well, in the he back has of your to, neck. But he has to. He, ha- he had to leave. Because he has to prove that he could do it without them. They already did it without him. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they do it again makes him even look even worse. So it's on Kevin Durant to prove that he can do it with somebody else. And I don't really know if that's going to happen. Either way, we win. Either way, we win. Because neither one of us care for Mr. Irving or Mr. Durant. I, I mean, I don't care for Kyrie Irving. I think he's a really good player. Uh, Kevin Durant, I just thought better of him. You know, I thought... I, I always thought he was just a step below LeBron, but I don't know. I mean, the way LeBron played everything out, it seemed to work well. We love youth sports. Not only do they get the kids out and active, but they teach the necessary skills of teamwork, sportsmanship, and fair play. One organization that we are proud to partner with is Osning AYSO Soccer. Their mission is to develop and deliver quality, player-centered youth soccer programs that promote a fun, fair, family environment where everyone is welcome and everyone plays. If you have a child between the ages of 4 and 18, registration for the Fall 2022, Spring 2023 season opens April 27th with an early bird special. Sign up before June 15th for only $175 per child. For more information, to sign up, or to volunteer as a coach or referee, go to AYSO201.org today. The more volunteers, the more children can enjoy the youth soccer experience with Austining AYSO. That's AYSO201.org. More soccer for more kids. AYSO201.org. Visa and MasterCard payments only. We 
are set for the semifinals of the NHL. You have the Oilers taking on the Abs and the Rangers taking on the Tampa Bay Lightning. You have the star-studded Oilers with all their number ones. You have your Dreisaitl. You have your McDavid going up against your Kale McCarr and your Gabriel Landeskog and your Nathan McKinnon. Like That is a star-studded matchup. In the Eastern Conference, you have the lunch pail grip of the New York Rangers, studded with a little bit of skill, going up against the two-time, 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 back-to-back Stanley Cup champions, the Tampa Bay Lightning. Currently, the Rangers are up 4-2 to two on the Lightning in the second period with about a minute 53 to go in the period. So, who you got? Basic question. Who you got? Yeah, so, you know, we talked about it in the production meeting. I'm sticking with, I'm a Ranger fan. I want the Rangers to win. But to be the man, you got to beat the man. And, man, the Tampa Bay Lightning are good. I know they're down 4-2 right now. But they're they're good. Their goalie's good. I'm sticking with the Lightning on, on the Eastern Conference side. And in the West, you know, I've been saying it all along that I thought the Avalanche was the most talented group. Um, you know, the Oilers are star-studded. They got their dry sidles and their McDavid's. But I think I think Colorado is going to beat them and outlast them. So I got Colorado going to the Cup to face the Tampa Bay Lightning. Solid. Solid. Now, I also have Colorado going just for the simple fact that Mike Smith is not a great goalie. Like Mike Smith is just not that great. He's 41 years old. He's been he's been eh, solid, unspectacular. Like that is who you're trusting in net, right? You have Drysidle, you have McDavid, you have Evander Kane. Like that was a very risky signing by Edmonton, and it seems to be working off. You know, it seems to be working out very well, but. Colorado is just too good. They've been knocking on the door for too long. Their team is too balanced. And one like one line, like we said before about your short rotation, right? In basketball, one line is not going to win you a Stanley Cup. One line can get hot and win you a series. But when you have to win 16 games, 16 that's tough. That's tough. And we're going to see. We're going to see what happens when Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl play with a little bit of adversity. They're already down 1-0 in the series. Like, we'll definitely see what they're made of. As far as you know, Tampa Bay and the Rangers, the Rangers are the more battle-tested team. They're physical. They're tough. They match up very well. This is going to be a very highly contested series. It's not going to be the sweep that was in the regular season. More battle tested. This More team, battle tested. The Lightning are going for their third Stanley Cup, and they just what battled. They, they just battled back against the, the against the Maple Leafs, and then they swept Florida out. Ooh, and the Florida was the best scoring team in the league this year. Are you gonna say that they the Rangers are more battle tested this year? Absolutely. This year, absolutely. Those guys, like. The Barclay Goodrows of the world. You have a lot of players that are no longer there, right? You have Yanni Gord is no longer there. You have players that were key integral parts of this roster that are no longer there. Strawman's gone. Uh, Shattenkirk was there for a while. You have players that you tried to replace and you've done a, a decent job of doing so, but you know, outside of Pat Maroon and Steven Stamkos and Kucherov, there's a lot of turnover. Kalor, and also, you have to take into account, like, are these guys, like, the Kalorns and everything, are they going to be able to go with the grind of it all? Because it's three consecutive years. Three-peat is hard to do. Back-to-back, you see it in basketball, right? 
repeating is difficult. Repeating, they're they're just not done. And it's something to be said about the physicality of it. Because you're able to, the Lightning are able to skill their way through, but the Rangers play, the style of which they've been playing this year, lends itself more to the playoffs. It's tough. It's physical. It's hard-nosed. It's what you need. Everyone knew what needed to be done with this team. Chris Drury went out and did it. Like, this team was soft. Very talented. Very talented, but soft. You bring in a guy like Ryan Reeves. Ryan Reeves, who has Stanley Cup experience. Barclay Goodrow, who has Stanley Cup experience, who has a ring from said Lightning. You bring in a guy like Justin Braun, playoff experience in San Jose. It's the right additions, it's the right mix of guys that are going to give, they're going to give Tampa Bay a run for their money. Now, it's not, like I said, it's not going to be a sweep. You can't expect that. Also because there are no shootouts, and they won't, the Rangers want to shoot at. So, the, it remains to be seen. But, I like the Rangers' chances. And I really think that the Rangers and the Avalanche are on a collision course. And then once you get there, all bets are off. If you've ever listened to a podcast and thought to yourself, hey, I can do this, then do I have the tools for you? If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. No specialty training, no specialty programs needed. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Plus, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. How cool is that? It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Go to anchor.fm and get started today. That's anchor.fm. What are you waiting for? Download the app. But um, after, after the shooting took place in Texas last week, Gabe Kapler, the manager of the San Francisco Giants, announced that he will not be coming out of the clubhouse for the playing of the National Anthem for the rest of the season. Kapler said he won't be coming out until he sees some real change in this country. Do you stand with Gabe on this one? Well, he kind of already backtracked on that since he was out for the Memorial Day game because, you know, it's Memorial Day and we're honoring our fallen soldiers. So I can understand why, like, he would take that time to honor our country. But, you know, I agree with the sentiment. I definitely agree with the sentiment. Like, we're going the wrong way right now. I I frankly agree that, you know, things need to be done differently and we need to clean up our act as far as gun control and gun safety. But, um... It's an issue, you know, it's how do you go about, how do you go about getting your message across? Now, Gabe Kapler is more than entitled to because, I mean, it's his right to not participate in the, you know, in the national anthem, but he, it's his prerogative to do so. Um, you are going to get a lot of flack for it and he's taking it in stride. He's taking it, he's taking the heat. He's stepping up. He's owning it. So kudos to Gabe Kapler. And, you know, we can we can find a way, right? We can, well, at least we used to be able to discuss the, these things, right? We used to be able to actually have a civil conversation about topics like this. But now we're very quick to demonize. We're very quick to brandish someone as unpatriotic. And, you know, I think we need to get back to that civil discourse. And if this act by Gabe Kapler is the catalyst for that discussion, then frankly, I'm all for it because it needs to be had and we need to figure this out. 
Yeah, I might agree if Dave Gabe Tapler wasn't such a douche, honestly. Uh, you know, I don't stand with Dave. I don't. I don't stand with Gabe on this one. Uh, I think that he's taking a page out of Kaepernick's book. You know, and I think it's time people start doing something different. You know, I think he should come up with his own way to protest. It doesn't have to be standing for the anthem, coming out for the anthem, kneeling for the anthem, sitting for the anthem. Forget about the anthem. We're on from that. Let's move on to something else. Like, what else could you do? Like, you know, let's with Kaepernick, he knelt for the anthem, but he also gave back to the community. He was going to protest. He was doing things. He was very active in the community. So it's like, Gabe, okay, you're not going to come out for the anthem, but what are you going to do aside from that? You going to anti-gun rallies? You going to sell your guns? Like, what's your plan? Like, what else are, what else are you going to do? I hate to say it that way, but that's really what it comes down to. It's like, okay, that's, that's something that everyone's – it's been done before. We've been dealing with it for four or five years now. What – else are you going to do so i think he could do better and i think he could come up with another way to show how he feels about the direction of this country because let's be real guys you know the we're not changing nothing is changing you know Ka- kaepernick's gonna be kneeling for the flag until he dies is cape Kaplan gonna stay in the clubhouse for the rest of his life there's, there's no change zipping in here i don't know about that but you know what the, the players his players are standing with him. So he definitely, he has a little bit of momentum on his side. And a lot of major league managers also agree with the sentiment. Uh, He definitely has his supporters. Now he also has one very loud, very famous and vocal detractor in Tony La Russa. Like Tony La Russa came out against him saying that, you know, because of the the troops and what the flag symbolizes and what the national anthem symbolizes, you know, that's something that, you know, I, I you agree, we agree to disagree because I, you know, like, I think you can, you can separate and we can have a nuanced argument and we can be able to be mature enough to separate all of these things and really talk about and really focus in on the things that are of an issue, right? And I think if anything has come out of these recent years is that, you know, we've kind of lost that. And, you know, if we're having civil discourse, we definitely can, you know, we can definitely make that happen. But, you know... We, as Americans, we love to talk past each other. And when we're talking, like I say to my students, if you're talking, you're not listening. Your ears and your mouth cannot work at the same time. Avoid messy accidents. Get better stopping power with your brake pads. Callahan brake pads. You never know when you'll be driving in the road and there will be a truck tire that you need to avoid and save your family. Callahan Auto, we really care about what's under your hood. The <laughs> Phillies seem to be heading in the wrong direction. Like, you know, everything, everything about the Phillies, forget what you knew. Forget what you thought you knew, I should say. They are 3-7 and seven in their last 10 games. They're currently 11 games back of my first place, Max. Seven games under 500. Bryce Harper can't play the field because of his elbow. Is Girardi going to survive this? Is, Gir- is Joe Girardi going to be the manager of the Phillies at the end of this year? I mean, they're actually, they lost yesterday, so they're eight games under five. No! I think, I mean, listen, I, I think he should be, because Joe is not the problem. The team was poorly constructed, and they're all struggling. I mean, this team was supposed to bang the ball out of the yard. They're just not. You know, Harper's hurt. Castellanos is not having a good season. Uh, Schwerber is batting 184 at the leadoff spot. I mean, how how are you going to generate runs when your leadoff guy is batting 184? Uh, and then, let's see. Uh, Real Muto only has three home runs after 40 games. Like, that's just... This was supposed to be a team that was going to bang it out of the yard. They're not banging it out of the yard. 
Gene Segura is going on injured reserve with for 12 weeks because he can't bunt. <laughs> he, he went to bunt and he broke his pinky or fractured his index finger. He's done until September. Thanks, Gene. Thanks for playing. Uh, <laughs> uh, Aaron Nola is their guy, right? Mm-hmm. He, he's just not. He's, I think his ERA is in the fours and the fives. The Mets are just the. You know they're just tearing it up right now. The here come the Braves and the Marlins are the Marlins. So I, it's not it's not Joe's fault. I don't put it on Joe, but this team is is playing terribly. I don't put it on Joe Girardi at all. I agree with you. He had he he doesn't make the roster decisions at the end of the day. You know the the GM signs the free agents. Like he ultimately does that. So, but on paper, it looked good. I mean, yeah, that before we, I mean, before this, yeah, I, I thought they were going to bang the ball out of the yard. I thought they were going to average between six and seven runs a game. I really did. I mean, it's hard. I thought it was hard to pitch that lineup. I really did. But it's not. <laughs> it's just not. I mean, Castellanos, is, it's embarrassing. It's like, who are you? Where's the guy that was on the Reds last year tearing the cover off the ball? Ruben Moto, three home runs. Dude, Schmerber, 184. Come on, I could bat 184. Well, they are definitely, you know, they were saddled with a lot of this from Matt Klintak. Now Sam Fold is the GM. So, you know, there's something to be said about that. But we're going to go back to the names that you listed, right? You're looking at Reese Hoskins. You didn't mention him, but he's a butcher. He's trash. He's a butcher. Nick Castellanos. Better suited to be a DH, but Bryce Harper can't flex his arm. Like, Odubel Herrera. Eh, so, eh, nothing to be, nothing to write home about. Kyle Schwarber, a butcher. But you brought in players who are defensively challenged, and you wonder why you can't feel the ball. That, that's just a flawed roster construction. Like, you, I mean... Those three guys are redundant. Hoskins, Schwarber, and Castellanos are redundant type players. The only difference is, is that Schwarber's left-handed. <laughs> and you're you're banking on the fact that, you know, you're banking on the fact that you're gonna win eleven to ten. Cause you went your big free agent bullpen signings, right? Because the bullpen was atrocious last year for the Phillies. So you brought in to back up the li- the likes of the immortal Connor Brogdon, the immortal Sir Anthony Dominguez, you decided to bring in Corey Knable. Okay, that's fine. He he was with the Dodgers. He, he got his ring, but Corey Knable hasn't been All Star level in several years. And then you went and signed former Mets, Jerry's Familia, who. If that sinker isn't working, forget it. Like, it's done. Uh, That ball is going to be out of the park. And then Brad Hand, Brad Hand hasn't been good in two years. So you're you're kind of, you're on name only at that point. And, you know, it wasn't enough and it wasn't the right, it wasn't the right players based off of last year in order to really bolster this team and make you think that they'll be able to withstand like this kind of offensive shellacking that you're going to be getting from these pitchers. I mean, if you look at the rotation, right? Wheeler, okay, Wheeler is proving to be the goods. Nola is solid, like nothing to write home about. Then you're looking at Kyle Gibson, Zach Eflin, They've run Nick Nelson out there a couple times. Ranger Suarez, Christopher Sanchez. Like, like, this was this was a very poorly constructed team, and that doesn't fall on Joe Girardi. Joe Girardi can only do what he can with what he's got. Bill Parcells once famously said, "You can't expect me to cook the meal without shopping for the groceries." Or I can at least give you a shopping list, you know? I can at least give you a shopping list if I'm Joe Girardi. This is what I need, and can we possibly 
get somebody better than the guys we brought in? Can you possibly not look at a baseball card, not look at, you know, fantasy baseball? Because analytics, like, I mean, analytics may make it real, make it look like these are solid signings, but Castellanos has been a defensive liability for years. Schwarber's been a defensive liability for years. Their best player is merely an average fielder, according to Fangraphs. Their best fielder of their starting nine is merely average. So, you know, defense matters. Sorry. It's the in route where friends of the show get a special segment with us. Want to be part of the action? Want to be the newest member of the in crowd? You know what to do. Hit us up, faderoutemail at gmail.com or slide in those DMs on Fade Route Podcast on IG or hit that Twitter, Fade Route DNZ. Joining us on the in route today, we have former Spack and Kill head football coach Clinton D'Souza. Thanks for joining us today on the show. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Like right. it's all ours. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're going to start you off with this. Um, NIL seem to be sweeping across college football, creating a spat between Jimbo Fisher and Nick Saban. Do you see NILs affecting the player-coach relationship, especially if a player is not getting playing time he needs? Yeah, I think anytime you, you know, first let me say I think the players deserve – some sort of compensation for the money they bring into these colleges. And I, and I get the whole deal with name, image, likeness. Uh, but I do think it creates you know, kind of the unintended consequences of what schools kind of fostering better NIL deals with private companies, what kind of situation a kid is in if not getting the playing time, therefore his name, image, likeness is not out there as much as a company may like or, you know, vice versa. So I, I think it is going to be an extra strain. Just like I remember when I first started coaching, the, the height of social media really kind of hit the wave of, of high schoolers and it became another added layer. Like it used to be the policing the locker room. Now you had to police their Twitter and Instagram accounts. Um, I, I think it's just another added layer for coaches to have to police, navigate, negotiate, um, and, and, and kind of deal with especially the high profile players that are going to have this, um, this kind of level. Wow. So you could see a coach getting into it with a supporter or with a influencer. Oh yeah. I, I think, I think they also already navigate high priority or high profile, uh, alumni and, and boosters. So I imagine them, you know, kind of offering their two cents on what NIL deals these kids should get and, how, how that kind of plays into scenarios. I, I think it's just an added political storm that, you know, just pulls coaches away from what they like to do, which is coaching football. And I think it just kind of becomes another added burden. Um, and I think that's what Saban was trying to, he didn't do it right. He didn't do it professionally, but I think that's essentially what he's trying to gripe about is that it's just another added thing that, is a part of recruiting now these high level players um and i think he let out frustration in, in an improper improper way but you know I, I get it i know where where he's coming from in a sense of it's just another added layer to a coach yeah well, he, def- he definitely wasn't ready for it he no wasn't absolutely ready not it. absolutely not and bill parcells has free has famously said like if you want to you want him to cook the meal you gotta let him shop the groceries but now apparently in college you also have to negotiate with vendors. Like this is a very <laughs> weird, very weird situation that we're living in right now. Hundred percent, yeah. And and think about how high level of recruiting and and all the things that go into it. Whether it's upgrading their locker room and having these locker rooms that look like multi million dollar estates and, and all those factors that go into recruiting. Now all that takes a backseat to what kind of nil deal or you know what these kids are going to get out of the experience more than a degree and more than uh, a, a possible championship now they want that as, to be a factor too which 
I don't blame them because they bring, make millions of dollars for uh, the university, but it's it's tough. Yeah. Well, we know you are a Nick fan, and it must have killed you to see the Celtics get to the Eastern Conference Finals with homegrown players, and the Heat get to the final, the, the Eastern Conference the Eastern Conference Finals, mainly through trades and acquisitions. So, which route should the Knicks take over the next two or three years to become relevant again? I. I I honestly think the Knicks have have done a good job of kind of cleaning the cupboard and starting fresh with homegrown talent. Um, you know, kind of. I, I never was a huge fan of Julius Randle. Uh, I know he had a, a pretty outstanding year two years ago, um, and they kind of have built their homegrown talent around him. I think they should start to build it around RJ. Um, and I, I do like their defense first mentality. I, I know they're miles away from competing, but I think with a, a couple of uh, you know nice additions in terms of homegrown talent and continued progress and, and development of players, I, I think it, it's a, it's a long road. It's a five year plan, um, and and no Nick fan loves that plan because we've been on like the forty five year plan. Uh, <laughs> doesn't just seem to want to work, um, so. I think we all just got to be patient, hold out, because the splashy free agents, as we saw with the whole Durant Kyrie situation, are just not coming here uh, because it's not the ownership or the leadership that they want or the experience that they want. And I mean, I can't really blame them. I was pretty upset when it didn't happen, but I can't really blame them because the Knicks organization has been quite a show for a while. Yeah, I think they need to draft better. I mean, just looking, you know, the. Kevin Knox deal. I mean, you had Mikael Bridges, yeah. Shai Gilgis Alexander, Miles Bridges, Michael Porter Jr. Even though he's hurt, he's still a stud. Dante DiVincenzo. Like there are guys that they missed. But do you, so? Do you think they could build around Randall? Because for a while it seemed like that was the route they wanted to go. I mean, the guy's got a tattoo of Notorious B.I.G. on his on his arm. <laughs> I mean, he. I mean, where else could he possibly want to play? Yeah, I, I'm sure he wants to play here. I don't know if he wants to deal with everything that comes with that, though. Yeah, but his whole scenario of, of kind of like telling the crowd to shut up last year. And, yeah, I can't do you know, that. There, there's a level that Nick fans, Nick fans are going to love you something good, but they'll also hate you something good. So it's like one of those things where he's got a, and, and he got way too many technical fouls for my liking. You know, he just kind of let his, his poor play leak into dealing with the refs. Everything was a complaint. Um, so could they build around him? Two years ago, I thought he was an absolute stud and 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 certainly like unselfish and played well. Um, he's got to get back to that mentality and stop worrying about fouls. And you know, it, it seemed like last year he played with the pressure of the team building around me. Where two years ago he just played to prove that he's a good player. Yeah. Uh, so moving over to two teams that actually matter. Uh, the finals is set with the Warriors taking on the Celtics. The Warriors have the best shooters in the world. And the Celtics have five guys who received Defensive Player of the Year nominations. Which attribute is more appealing to you and which one prevails? Oh, man. I mean, I called defense for football quite some for quite some years. So I, I always like the defense first mentality. I, I think... The old adage that gets beaten around too much, but you know it, it does make sense. Defense wins championships. So, as much as I am a fan of the Warrior style, and I think their offensive style presents a lot of challenges for good defensive teams like the Celtics, um, it's just my it's just my philosophy and my nature to to side with the defensive side of things. Um, but I do think it will be a challenge. I, I think. I think the Celtics being able to switch everything, make it easier than most teams that have to kind of, you know, match up. Um, you know, they have just long bodies and they kind of built their team to be able to guard all five with all five. Um, and I think that's the style of NBA today to deal with offensive juggernauts like the Warriors. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, we'll see what happens. I do agree with you. Defense wins championships. In, in the NBA, defense definitely gets you there. If you're talking about one game, one series, I mean, it's tough. I mean, yeah. these guys shoot the lights out. I mean, it's, they're shooting from half court. I mean, the good thing about the Celtics is they got smart, right? He's he's their defensive player of the year. 
He's probably going to be on Curry, and that's what you want. Keep him under his average. He averages 26 points a game in the finals. If you can get him to stick around 20, 22, that's half the battle. Then you got to worry about Clay, and then you got to worry about Draymond. Like, they just have so much. But I do think that, you know, the Celtics have a good chance because they have a better team dynamic. Yes. And, and I always thought defensively, your philosophy, and I think it transfers to basketball too, is make them beat you with things. Um, and if they do, hats off. Like that's, you know, you gotta, and it's, it's not, it's easier said than done for sure, especially in basketball, but you gotta take away what they like to do and make them become the, the multidimensional team and prove that they can do other things than just, you know, feed Curry the ball and let him, let him dictate the pace and give him, you know, a rhythm to shoot. You got to really disrupt that. And if it, if it requires you to kind of leave some people open or, you know, play unsound at times, you almost got to live with it because why, why would you get beat by the thing everyone knows you're going to get beat by? Well, we know that you're passionate about the hardwood, but now we're going to get to your bread and butter. We're going to get to the gridiron. We know that you're a huge Jets fan. Yeah. And the team made some significant draft picks in the 2022 NFL draft. Reports indicate Zach Wilson has bulked up this offseason, which is good because he's a little bit of a string bean. So what kind of steps do you want to see him take this year to make you feel like the Jets got the right guy at QB? Uh, I, I want to see him thrive with the game on the line. Um, in the end, of, like week in, week out, quarterbacks are going to be put in scenarios where it's either the second to last drive or the last drive of the game. And they either have to ice the game or come back and, and score in in the final minutes. I want to see him do that, um, you know, and and, and do it consistently. Um, I think that will be a good sign of like, hey, this might be someone we can rely on. Um, and, and I want him to be able to really utilize his weapons. Um, they're not, you know, superstars. But they are dynamic enough to make plays. I think Elijah Moore has the potential to be a superstar down the line in the slot. Um, you know, how, how does he utilize those weapons? Is he holding the ball too long? Those are, those are things that I think he needs to make strides on in the second year for me to feel like, all right, this is, this is the guy. Well, we're talking about second year, so we've got to invoke the name of Matt Jones as well. We're going to transition up north to Foxborough as Bill Belichick and the Patriots are going to be entering their third season without Tom Brady. So does Belichick need to win a playoff game without Brady to validate his coaching prowess? Mm, the Jet fan in me wants to say yes <laughs> because I hate Bill Belichick, but uh, I hate him like I hated Michael Jordan when I was being a Nick fan in the 90s. You respect the game, that's why you hate him. Bill Belichick's the greatest coach of all time, in my opinion. So do I, does he need a, a championship without Tom Brady to validate that? In my opinion, no. I think it would be a nice cement for his legacy. Um, Not a championship. But, the, he's got to at least win one playoff game without Tom, right? Yeah. He's got to yeah. win a playoff game. We're just asking for a playoff game. Can you win a playoff game with arguably the be without the best quarterback of all time? I, I think he has to. I really do. Yeah, I think now that Tom's won a championship without him, you're right. Like, he does have to have something to say outside of Tom. Because, like you said, Tom's the best quarterback of all time, but he's able to do it without the greatest coach of all time. Right. So the greatest coach of all time has got to prove he can do something uh, in the postseason without the greatest quarterback of all time. So, yeah, I, I, I would say, yeah, at least a playoff game. Maybe not a championship because I, I don't know if the Patriots are necessarily championship caliber right now. Um, but yeah, because yeah, the big old Jets are in the way, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We're the juggernaut this year. <laughs> I mean, Pats are going to be, you know, they're definitely going to be tied for third place at some point in this division. So you know, the, the division runs through Buffalo. But let's just be realistic about that. So um, we'll get you out of here on this one, Coach. Colin Kaepernick worked out for the Raiders last week. The Raiders were said to be impressed with his ball placement and conditioning, but they don't appear to be signing him anytime soon. McDaniel said that 
he's not going to comment on a player until they sign him. So do you see any other teams giving Kaepernick a workout based off of this? And if they you do, anybody signing him? No, I, I don't. Um, I kind of subscribe to, to, the, to the fact that he had his moment and he just, and he, I guess, kind of blew it when he decided to go to a high school field and not sign the agreement that the NFL wanted him to sign. And I get why he didn't do it, but sometimes you have to play by the rules of the other team to get your message across better. Um, and he, and he just wanted to play by his rules. So I, I, I think it's a good sign that he got a workout. Do I think any team signs him? I think it would take a gutsy owner uh, and someone who's ready to take on a brunt of criticism across uh, right-wing media to be able to deal with kind of the aftermath of that because it's kind of slowed down pretty significantly with other players not kneeling and kind of the protest kind of becoming a, a, a less – known entity so yeah it, it would it's like when the team signed michael vick you know like you're gonna have to deal with that barnstorm for a little bit um and i i don't know if any owner's ready to make that jump you would think at that point you know but if this was the elder davis he probably would have pulled the trigger because he hated the nfl so much and yeah. the nfl hated him but uh, I, I don't know if mark davis has the stones to make that happen so uh i mean time will tell and at this point you know, it's father time. It's going to catch up to you. And he's fresh, but, you know, at some point, Cap's got to give it up the same way Tebow gave it up. So yeah. we'll just, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see where things go. But Coach Clinton D'Souza, thank you so much for coming on, being a part of the in crowd, joining us on the in route today. We understand your wife is in charge of a big time swimming program in Westchester and the lower Hudson Valley. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so she actually built this whole varsity program, Girls and Boys, from 2007 in Ossining. Uh, so she's the varsity Ossining uh, girls coach right now. She was girls and boys. But since we have two little girls of our own, she gave up one season. Uh, she's coached for 16 years. She has swimmers all over the place uh, that graduated. Now they swim in Virginia, the University of Virginia, uh, Bucknell, Vermont. Uh, she has one swimmer currently going to the University of Minnesota. She's won numerous league titles, state championship relay teams. Yeah, it's pretty amazing what she's able to do. And probably her biggest accolade, she had a diver uh, who was second in New York State um, and it dove for Harvard the past four years, just graduated from Harvard. So, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Wow, that's fantastic. So, that you know, big things are happening in Austin. You know, yep. we're, we are big proponents of Austin youth sports, particularly Austin AYSO. So, uh, nice to hear that big things are happening up in O. So, go Pride. And uh, thank you for joining us on the In Crowd, brother. Thank you for joining us on the In Route. And if you want to be the newest member of the In Crowd, hit us up at FadeRouteMail at gmail.com or slide in those DMs at FadeRoutePodcast on IG or on our Twitter at FadeRouteDNZ. And maybe you can be the newest member of the In Crowd. Former Spock and Kill head football coach Clinton D'Souza, thank you for joining us, brother, and we will have you on again soon. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Are you in need of air care maintenance or service? I have the company for you. Air Care Technicians. They service the Westchester and Northern Bronx area and can help you with all your heating and cooling maintenance and service needs. Just give them a call at 914-315-1547. Again, that's 914-315-1547. Or shoot them an email at aircaretechnicians at gmail.com. These guys are the real deal as they are veteran owned, licensed, and insured. Make sure to tell them that DNZ sent you. The Fade Store presents the Alleged Superstar of the Week Award. boys and girls it is time for the alleged superstar of the week you know how this goes we put up a poll 
on our Twitter account at FadeRouteDNZ and you vote and you vote and you vote and you vote. The winner of said vote gets announced on this here show and gets awarded the coveted ass trophy. Now, D, do you know, do you know who won the ass last week? I don't. Oh, I think you might. One Mr. Jackie, throw, one Mr. Jackie throwing Josh Donaldson. So, good job, Oh, Josh. yeah. Good My job, guy. Josh. You want to throw around the name of Jackie? Well, just, I have no idea what to say to that. You're just a jackass, is what we're going to say. But that was last week. This is this week. Who are your nominees, Dave? All right. So, up first, I have Deshaun Watson. Again. <laughs> 23rd woman to step forward in this lawsuit against Deshaun Watson. When is this ever going to stop? Cleveland Browns quarterback seems to be in a lot of trouble. Deshaun Watson, you're my alleged superstar of the week. Number two, Gene Segura. Fractured your finger while attempting to bunt. Have you ever bunted before? Keep your hand away from where the ball meets the bat. Damn it, Gene. 10 to 12 weeks. I'm not just saying that because you're my starting second baseman on my fantasy team. Gosh, damn it. And number three, Commissioner Mike Trout. Tommy Pham blamed you for being a terrible commissioner, which led to him slapping Jock Peterson. Understand your league. Some people take fantasy football very seriously. Mike Trout, you are my alleged superstar of the week. What do you got, Z? Well, I'm going to piggyback off of what you said with Mike Trout. I'm going to go with Tommy Pham. <laughs> Dude, are you kidding me? You're going to walk up to Jock Peterson and bitch slap him in, in public, right? With his teammates around him <laughs> over something that happened months ago. And something that is ridiculous an absolute ridiculous you're going to slap him over an error on an ESPN fantasy football league there were two separate designations in one league the player was on IR in the other league he was not on the IR and that equals a slap like, Tommy Pham is just an ornery dude at this point he wanted to fight Luke Voigt he wanted to fight Jock Peterson like, I think Tommy Pham just Tommy Fan needs a hug. Like, can, can we, you know, let's put an initiative out there. Let's sign a petition. We're going to give Tommy Fam a hug and hope he doesn't slap us in the face. Tommy Fam, you are my alleged superstar of the week. Josh Donaldson, you're back. You're back after your Jackie bullshit. He's hurt that the Yankees didn't publicly support him after his comment about Tim Anderson. The Yankees don't condone racism, Josh. Sorry. That is ridiculous. Your team is not... When you're acting like an asshole, your team is not going to have your back. Especially if they believe you're in the wrong. That's a tacit admission that you are in the wrong. Learn from it. Josh Donaldson, you are my alleged superstar of the week. And then last but not least... French security for macing Liverpool fans, causing an over a half hour delay, causing mass confusion, mass hysteria, dogs and cats living together. It was not pleasant and ultimately marred the UEFA Champions League final. French security, you are my alleged superstar of the week. I think we've said our piece, folks. The poll goes up after the show. And for our nominees. Just do better, boys. Just do better.
Your favorite podcast has its own merch line now. Go to the Fade Store with DNZ.com today for all your Fade Route merch needs. I'm talking tank tops, t-shirts, sweatshirts, like yoga pants, we got those too. Like some cool accessories, we got those too. And we're not done yet. We have so much more planned for you, but check out what we have today at the Fade Store with DNZ.com. That's the Fade Store with DNZ.com. Order up! All right, boys and girls, it is time for us to order up. Order up, order up. This week, we are ordering up our five favorite hockey sweaters of all time. From five to one, who you got, D? All right. Number five might surprise you a bit, but I got the Penguins. Whether it's the home or the away jersey, it's just beautiful. I love the home one with the uh, with the black and the yellow, and then the white one with the, the white, and then the yellow on the sleeves, and the black on the sleeves. Penguin holding the hockey stick. That's number five for me. And number four, I got the Sharks, but it's got to be the away jersey. It's the white one. You got the shark mm. on the front, chomping down on the hockey stick, weird triangle in the background. <laughs> that's, that's, that's number four for me. Number three, another one that might surprise you. I really like the Capitals jersey. It's got to be the white jersey. Um, I like how it says the Capitals across the front, all white with the stars and the and the the, the stick is the T. Love me a Capitals jersey. That Ovechkin number eight. Uh, number two, surprise, surprise. I think it's the Tampa Bay Lightning jersey, but it's got to be the away jersey, the white one. It's got the lightning on the front. It's all white, blue blue stripes on the sleeves. Uh, names and numbers in black with a white outline on the numbers. Nice jersey. And number one, probably your number one, New York Rangers jersey, but it's got to be the away jersey. Uh, you know, it's it's all it's uh it's it's red, white, and blue, well represented. You got the uh, Rangers diagonal across the front, and the letters in blue with the red outline. What do you got, Z? All fantastic choices. I'm just gonna throw that out there. All wonderful, fantastic choices. Now, I'm going with some retros. I'm going with some favorites of teams that are no longer with us. Some that have been rechristened from other locales. I'm gonna start with the Hartford Whalers. 1991-92. Come on, that green, white, and blue with HW on the inside, but it looks like a whale. That's just nostalgia, baby. That's just straight up nostalgia. Gordy Howe was in a similar jersey. Pat Verbeek was in that jersey. You know, Hartford was at one point a hockey town, as quietly as it's kept. And people are still clamoring for the Whalers to go back. And so much so that the Hurricanes acknowledge this and they, they actually wear Hartford Whaler uniforms. They wear Hartford Whaler sweaters some nights. So kudos to the Hurricanes. Good job for you. Good job by you. Number four, the Quebec Nordiques. Retro again. Specifically, 1980 to 1989. The beautiful pale blue, the Quebec blue, with the white trim and the fleur-de-lis on there. Can't top it. You know, whether it's the home or the road, either way, Either way, you're going to get a a fun, quality jersey. Number three, a little underrated. I don't know if, uh, you know, if anybody's going to agree with me, but it's my podcast. I don't care. 1996 to 2000 Buffalo Sabres. The red, the white, the black with the buffalo on it, right? Dominic Hasek staring you down. We're talking... And the Rangers just scored. It is now 5-2. The bread man just baked a goal for the New York Rangers. 
little breaking news right in the middle of my thought. But back to the Buffalo Sabres. That is just slick. I don't know. I have something for the black jerseys because I also, you know, I I had uh, the Sixers as one of my top jerseys, but it has to be the black one. And number two, speaking of the black one, LA Kings, 1988 to 1991, Wayne Gretzky, King's Ransom. You can't tell me that that's not a beautiful sweat. Like, that is just classy and clean. And frankly, the LA Kings need to wear that more often because that is their legacy. That is, that is sharp. And number one, of course it's the Rangers. I mean, <laughs> come on. Come on. What am I going to say? Am I going to say the Gordons Fishermen, the Islanders? No. Am I going to say the Liberty of the Rangers with the Lady Liberty? No. I hate that jersey. It, that sweater is cursed. I don't know why people hate that jersey. I really like that jersey. They never win in that sweater. <laughs> they never win. That's why Damn nobody it. likes it. They don't. If they won, nobody would say anything. But the classic cascading colors, the cascading red, white, and blue. I really like the alternate sweater as well, which is a darker navy blue. But either way... It's classic for a reason, and if you don't like it, it's our list. You make up your own list. Hit us up, faderobmail at gmail.com. Let us know what your sweaters are, because frankly, I'd like to know. This has been the Fade Route with DNZ. Thanks for tuning in tonight. You catch our podcast on Wednesday nights on Anchor, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, stay faded, everyone. Time for us to run the go route, but we'll talk to you next week. If you want to get on the action, we want to hear from you. Hit us up, faderoutemail at gmail.com. Slide in our DMs on IG at Fade Route Podcast. Drop us a DM on Twitter at Fade Route DNZ. Comment on our YouTube channel, The Fade Route with DNZ. Questions, comments, picks, segment suggestions, you name it, we want to hear from you. Get at us in crowd.